I have been asked by IMBCO to do a presentation today on our experience in teaching the 10 steps of IMBCI as part of the disaster recovery in the Philippines. So I will uh, begin by saying that Mercy in Action has been working in the Philippines since 1991. And even prior to IMBCI, we were following the mother-friendly um, steps. And so IMBCI has been our guiding light in that country since inception. I can't see to turn the next slide. You've got to get that out of my way. The slide turner is right there. OK. So the following teaching is about the 40-hour training um, in IMBCI that Mercy in Action conducted for capacity building in the Philippines disaster zone following Super Typhoon Haiyan. And I'm going to be explaining how we did this training and what uh, form it took. And I'll start with telling a little bit about the disaster that preceded it. But basically this training uh, was done from July to December. Uh, my slide is wrong. That was 2014. So it was last year. And it was done with a very generous grant from disaster, uh, the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the uh, disaster itself and on Mercy in Action in the Philippines. Mercy in Action was the first that we know of to um, bring all 10 steps in practice to the Philippines. There were other people and are people working very hard to uh, introduce the 10 steps in the Philippines. But I think our first center was the first um, MBNet site and the site that was doing all 10 of the steps. And we've been asked to teach about this all over the Philippines. We are very proud today to say, though, uh, as of very recently, there's a second IMBCI WebNet site, which is the Kumpio Clinic in Tanawan, Philippines, uh, that grew out of the ashes of this disaster. So November 8, 2013, we're almost on the anniversary of the second year of this terrible disaster, the largest storm uh, that the world had ever seen make landfall, made landfall in the Philippines. And this picture shows what happened to one birth center, one uh, midwife clinic, and that's the midwife standing in this picture showing us the, her beautiful birth center. Uh, literally smashed to smithereens. You can see bits of baby bed and what used to be uh, the tiles of a very nice clinic. It was all destroyed. This picture shows our rebuilding effort. And these men are men whose wives had their babies in the birth center before the disaster. And they were the ones that built it back um, with help from Mercy in Action and grants that we were able to receive. And we were very excited, not even one year later, in September of 2014, to reopen this clinic. And that's a picture of myself with Nerissa uh, in her new center, which is now fully accredited and um, a very busy birth center again in the Philippines. So a little bit of background on our storm. These are pictures my husband found of before and after. Uh, when we arrived down on Lete Island, uh, it looked like the pictures on your right, but it had previously looked like the pictures on your left. So you can see what total destruction happened in that place. We went down to launch a disaster response in November of 2013, right after the storm. And there was nothing left for mothers and babies but total destruction and homelessness, as this picture shows. The hospitals were down. The clinics were down. The midwifery centers were broken, everything was broken uh, as far as you could drive in any direction. So Mercy in Action went down and set up tents at ground zero, and that began um, our two months of, of living in these tents and delivering babies in these tents. And uh, that's a picture of my daughter-in-law, Rose Penwell, and I in the birth tent. And this is what our birth tent looked like. I am um, going to mention here that a year ago we did a webinar that talked about how we were able to keep all 10 steps even under these uh, terrible conditions and in a very cramped tent, but we did it. We were given a broken down school building to camp in, and we dealt with constant birth 
emergencies. We also dealt with a lot of other medical emergencies. Here's Rose suturing a man's foot. People were digging through the rubble, trying to find survivors, trying to find loved ones, trying to find bodies, trying to rebuild. And so we were constantly suturing men's hands and feet and giving tetanus shots. And we did an awful lot of other things besides midwifery, including helping bury the dead. This was a funeral for a baby that we actually conducted because there were no priests or ministers to do it. Uh, and one of our big roles there was to take the aid that was coming in from all over the world. These were USA AID supplements um, and get them out to all the pregnant and lactating women. And two months later, uh, we turned over our birth tents to Robin Lim, shown in this picture, and we began to rebuild. So in two short months during the disaster, we had 116 babies plus 3,616 uh, other medical encounters. And so this slide kind of shows the scope of what went on in that short two-month period of time. What we did right after that was to begin to rebuild. And this is a slide World the health organization put out at the six-month anniversary of this disaster. And you can see all the things they said were needed down there in the Philippines in the disaster zone. Um, you can see that a full third of this slide is talking about the pregnant women and the breastfeeding women. And these were the numbers they come, came up with that were in need, um, that no longer had health care facilities or midwives uh, after the storm. And so that became the big focus of our rebuilding. And one of the things that we did is we went back to Tacloban, and this is a picture of the airport as they're rebuilding and, and putting things back together. Uh, we wrote and were given a grant by the Center for Disaster Plans. Um, Global Giving is a site that we're a part of, and they were the ones that referred us to Center for Disaster Philanthropy. They asked us to do capacity building among the surviving midwives. And when we were given this task, the first thing we thought of is we don't have a better model anywhere than the IMBCI. And so we chose to use that as our curriculum, and our grant specified that we would do this training to bring up the capacity of the midwives, bring them up to date on best practices worldwide to try to make things better than they were before this disaster. And so we created uh, this 40-hour course as our curriculum using IMBCI. And here's a picture of my son, Ian, who is also a midwife and um, a medical or a pre-med student right now. He'll be going to medical school. But I, I love this slide because it says the words, the power of IMBCI. And we have felt that for decades in the Philippines, the power of IMBCI to, to be the tool that we would use to bring change and to make this larger than just what Mercy in Action was doing. And so the very first day as we began our capacity building training, uh, we showed them uh, the PowerPoint that IMBCI has and is available to everyone online uh, to tell them the history of it um, and to explain the power of IMBCI to be uh, this culturally competent um, human rights framework that ties in things they were already aware of, like the World Health Organization Safe Motherhood Initiative, the um, Millennial Development Goals, uh, the UNICEF's Baby Friendly Initiative. They were all familiar with that. They were not familiar with IMBCI. And I just want to say that if, so Nerissa Cumpio was the midwife. We chose to build her entire birth center back for her. We couldn't do everything, but we chose one project. But we would have done this 40-hour training just for this one midwife. That's how strongly we feel about it, because we feel that we don't want to start a birth center anywhere in the world where the staff is not trained on IMBCI. So if it had just been for her, we would have done it. But uh, we put the word out, and we had over a dozen of the midwives that had survived the storm that were in the area uh, that came to the training. So our first training happened seven months after the disaster in July. And I'm so sorry. I feel embarrassed. My slides, I, I don't know what happened to my brain, but I put 2015 on all of these. This is 2014. So 
Um, I need to change those slides. I'm embarrassed. But this was last year. So we started seven months after the disaster, um, which was pretty fast to get something like this in place and get it done. And these were some of the first participants that we had in our class. And this was so new to them. And here's a, another shot of the, the midwife survivors of Super Typhoon High. And um, most of them had lost their place where they worked. Most of them no longer had a clinic to work in. Many of them were working for NGOs that were down there doing disaster relief. Um, some of them had worked for Mercy in Action uh, when we were down there. Others of them, their, their, their birth center survived. They just lost the roof, maybe, if they were a little farther away from the ocean. Um, and some of them were just, you know, getting ready to rebuild. So what we did on the first day was we did an intro to IMBCI. We told the whole history and we went through all the steps. So basically we took them through the PowerPoint that IMBCI has available on the website. And we spent some time just giving them that orientation to it and taking them quickly through all the steps, just as we've done for many groups when we're introducing this concept for the first time. And then, one by one, we took about four hours on every single step. So we broke it down where we would do two steps per month. Here's Rose now starting to teach through step one. And we did it on PowerPoint in a conference room that we'd set up um, in a uh, hotel that had built, built back already. I mean, it was, we're still in the midst of the disaster zone, so, you know, you have limited ability for facilities, but they did have electricity back up by seven months after, and so we did this through the PowerPoint slides. We took them through step one, which, of course, is to treat every woman with respect and dignity and give her full informed consent, and I just want to say this was a really new concept for these um, these providers that had not been something they were trained in. The whole concept was of what, what, I mean, they would agree to the words, but when we would start breaking down what that meant, that the woman actually had rights and could actually have informed refusal for something, or just the language we would use toward her, um, the respect and dignity, it was, it was apparent that most of them, uh, this was very foreign. Um, some of them were excited by it, some of them were resistant to it, and we'll talk about that as we go. The, 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 the places where people would begin to tell stories and you would realize that they, um, that this was just pretty foreign to them. Uh, step two is to possess midwifery knowledge and skills that enhance and optimize physiology. And we think that that's such a standard of midwifery everywhere in the world, but again, we had a lot of updating to do. Um, a lot of them had been taught, well, all of them had been taught in the medical model in a hospital, um, so there was a lot to do to teach normal physiology. We could have we could have taken a lot longer. I just want to say four hours on each step step was not even enough. It was just enough to really start to introduce concepts to people. Now, some of the logistics I'll talk about before we go too much farther is that we um, paid for their travel expense to be able to come to this because these are survivors, right? They've lost everything and 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 everything is in terrible shape down there. We we um, we initially hadn't thought of this, and people came to the first training very excited, and then we realized if they're going to make it back for all five trainings over the next five months, uh, this is going to be a really important key piece. And so everyone was so incredibly grateful. It, it really made the training successful to be able to provide that, and it wasn't very much money. Um, we gave everyone a travel budget of, you know, maybe um, the equivalent of U.S. $10 to, to get there. Some of them came from um, three hours drive away. We provided lunch in the hotel, so we, we made that a big festive thing where we had a nice conference room. We provided lunch and everyone got to order what they wanted. We gave an incentive at the very beginning that we said anyone that completed the training was going to get a, a fully stocked new birth bag and all the emergency equipment that they didn't even have before the storm. Um, so that was an incentive. Uh, we had lots of participation and storytelling while we, were, while we were teaching. We tried to make room for that so it wasn't all PowerPoints. Uh, we took photos of every single session, and we gave printed T-shirts to the midwives. And I think over the course of five trainings, we did three different T-shirts. So we didn't do one for every single month, but almost. And we really tried to celebrate them as midwives. 
because they're in a culture where they're not always celebrated. They feel like they're at the bottom of the totem pole, um, below doctors and nurses, and you know they just feel very lowly in the whole scheme of things. So we really celebrated how important they were. We stressed a lot how much the World Health Organization, the IMBCI, uh, values midwives. So we also gave them a printed copy of the IMBCI slide. So here you see Rose and another one of our trainers with Nerissa. Uh, we, we just basically took these again off the free resource that IMBCI provides to us and had those printed and put them in um, a booklet form so that they would have them. And there's the end of the first training. Everyone got t-shirts. Everyone was so excited. Uh, about IMBCI. The, the t-shirts, some of them had the um, the logo of, of IMBCI, some of them had the logo of Mercy in Action on the front, and then they would say, um, you know, IMBCI training on the back. Um, some of them said, I follow the 10 steps, ask me how. You know, we did some fun slogans with those, and thanks to my husband, Scott, for creating those. The second training was in August. Again, I have the wrong date, 2014. And this time when we went down, we brought the midwives vitamins. So every time we went, we tried to bring them something to give to their patients, or we call them clients in America, but they call them patients. And so we wanted them to have something to give to the people they were starting now. They were building back. They are starting to care for the pregnant women again, and we wanted to support them in that. So um, this was part of a grant we got from Vitamin Angels, so thanks to them, and we were able to take the midwives vitamins. During this training, we went through step three and four. Um, this is one they don't have in the Philippines at all, really, yet, to let the mother have a companion. This was a really big deal, and there was some pushback, and there was all these excuses of why this is just um, really hard to do. Um, but we told them over and over about how in Mercy in Action we've been doing that for decades and, and how much the mothers love to have their their husband or their mother with them. And um, we just really, really stressed the not separating mother-baby. That was also a new, pretty new idea that, uh, not completely new nowadays because they have been doing skin-to-skin -skin now for the last few years for a short time after birth, uh, but fathers in the hospitals are still not allowed in. So this, is, this was something that um, they were familiar with, like other countries do that, but to bring it to the Philippines, there was still a lot of, well, we're not allowed, or fathers are not allowed, or we're too crowded, we can't have that. So we just had to do a lot of problem solving with them about the things they would bring up. Um, step four is to provide drug-free comfort and pain relief measures. Now, the poor women in the Philippines, when they go to the hospital, don't have drugs. The rich women now are having a lot of drugs. Um, but when the women don't have drugs, they also don't have any uh, comfort measures. So it, it can be a very cruel experience for them laying in, in a bed, sharing it with one or two other women in the throes of labor and having nobody comforting them in any way, having no comfort relief. So to, to explain to them about comfort care, to show them some of the things like, you know, the birth balls or the squatting bars or um, how we create our beds with the head post that women can, you know, use as a squatting bar, things like that, was a bit of a revelation. Uh, they have a lot of fun and giggled a lot during this part. Um, we realized when we talked about upright birth that they would, um, they would seem to be with us until somebody would start telling a story and then say, I had a woman one time and she wouldn't lay down. And they just talked about how upset they were by that, that it just really upset them when a woman wanted to stand up to give birth. And so we just had a lot of talking and realized there's a long ways to go for them to overcome uh, their training. The third training was held in September. Oh, I finally got the date right on this one, 2014. Uh, that was another midwife from the US that flew in to help, help me do that training. And in this training, we went through step five. Uh, this is where we provided the evidence-based practices proven to be beneficial. And again, it was not surprising to me because I've lived in that country for, worked in that country for 24 years, but there was an awful lot of lack here that the midwives didn't particularly know. Um, they knew about the skin to skin. Uh, that was, that was something that, that has been being pushed by our health department for a while. The breastfeeding by one hour is still a hard concept for them because, um, 
because they just they just you know they just do other things to the baby first and kind of miss that. So we we did spend a lot of time going over the Ghana and Nepal studies and really talking about the importance of that first hour to get the colostrum for survival. Uh, we talked about optimal cord cutting, upright birth, mother's choice. Again, like I said, there was pushback on that. Like we just can't handle it if the mother won't lay down. Um, it was all different from their routine, and so uh, so it was. Um, it was new, and I think that we could go back, you know, next year and do the whole thing again, and it would be really beneficial with the same group of women because I think they just need the reinforcement. Uh, even though we took four hours on every step, like I said, I think we could do double or triple that, and it would be good. Uh, step six was also in this training about avoiding potentially harmful procedures. Now, this is where it was nice to just be doing a PowerPoint out in front of the room and telling them, this isn't me talking, this is an international consensus, um, you know, that IMBCI is larger than just one group or one country, that they really represent all these countries in their, you know, uh, understanding of what makes birth safe. Uh, because we were saying things now, we knew we were stepping on toes, that we were saying things are harmful that they were used to doing routinely. And some of those things are like fundal pressure, uh, fundal pressure is just so entrenched in the country. It happens in hospitals. It happens in home birth. Uh, so the frequent vaginal exams. The woman in stirrups like this. Um, when we get our health centers accredited, we have to have a delivery table with stirrups, and women are supposed to deliver on them. And and so they don't they don't accept all of our um, IMBCI you know friendly rooms with the with the normal beds and the birth tubs and the hanging bars. They want, when they inspect us and give us our license, to have a delivery table with stirrups. So we've kind of gotten around that over the years, and now maybe some of these midwives will be too. Um, but that's a big one. That's a big one. And they're not up to date on the new uh, NRP recommendations to not suction, um, you know, live babies, to not do caregiver directed pushing. So this is kind of a just it was new, but um, there were there were the younger midwives were very excited by it. I just have to say, uh, and Narissa, the midwife we were were sponsoring, it was so excited by it. Now her mother in law um, was a little more reticent about some of the ideas. Her mother in law is a midwife, also an older one, and um, she wasn't quite sure about all this. But in the end, love wins. My sister sent me these um, stickers <laughs> from her. She's a cap at doula, and uh, this is a slogan, love wins. And so um, we we held those up, and everybody had big smiles at the end of this training, which we knew was a little bit um, intense for them to be telling them, oh, this that you're used to doing is on this list of things that we should only be doing in emergencies. But they were hanging in there with us. We gave more vitamins, and this time we also gave baby hats to them to give to their uh, pregnant women they were caring for. And so there, that made them very, very happy, and we felt like that also really added value to um, their ability to care for the women while they were going through this training that we were doing. Okay, the fourth training was in October. Uh, now I got this date wrong. I do not know what had happened to me when I was making these slides. All of this occurred in 2014. Uh, this is a couple of our national midwives that work with us in Alangapo that took the, the training down this month. So we all took turns doing it. Everybody on our staff took turns going down and doing different trainings. Um, we went in pairs at least of two by two. So step seven is to implement measures that enhance wellness and prevent emergencies, illness, and death of mother baby. And boy, we had a lot to teach on that one. Uh, we taught the midwives how we are doing things um, in our center to use the rapid test the, for malaria and Hep B and HIV, and how to treat those things if they happen, how to counsel, counsel and refer. And so this was something we felt really good about leaving um, on that island that they had not been doing any of those things before. Uh, make sure every woman has a series of tetanus immunizations, and this is one of our clients that lives on the garbage dump. Every every town of any size in the Philippines has a garbage dump, and there's actual families and people that live on it and make their living there. And, and that's actually true in most of the developing world. It's a pretty rough place to be pregnant. And things like tetanus immunizations are pretty stand, standard, and we want to make sure those are 
happening for everyone. We also did a training on emergency uh, treatment of life-saving complications, and we introduced the um, non-inflatable anti-shock garment that we talked about in our last uh, webinar that we had ordered, I think, 13 of them and had them shipped in from China, and we were giving them out to midwives in the disaster zone, doctors, hospitals. Uh, Ian trained the um, Doctors Without Borders staff in these. Uh, we we just real, these were life saving down there. So what we did for this training is we bought a pair for um, not for every individual midwife that was in our training, but for every um, clinic represented there that was open, every birth center or home birth practice that was actually open and operational. We made sure they had a pair. So um, there were some centers um, that had you know two or three midwives represented, and we'd give one to their center. And so on this training, we took down the anti-shock garments and left them with the midwives and trained everybody in them. That was part of our emergency training. So there's a picture from our disaster tent. We used these a lot because we the hospitals were smashed and there was no backup. And we had a lot of hemorrhages because the women were so beat up and starved and they were in terrible shape. So. Um, we really would never want to be in a disaster without our anti-shock garment or anywhere else, actually. And there's Narissa now back at her clinic. She's showing all the things we're giving her. She's got her vitamins behind her. She's got her anti-shock garment in her hand. She's got different booklets that we're giving her. This was one of the booklets that went with the anti-shock garment. So we were trying to just really um, bring up what they were able to offer to their patients. And the fifth and final training was December, and obviously this slide is wrong too. It should be 2014. My husband Scott went down with me, and we did the final training um, early in December. So that one was kind of should have been the late November, but um, we were just a week later than that. Uh, we did the last two steps, and so this is a picture of Ian in the Doctors Without Borders tent during the disaster, doing the training on the anti-shock garment. Uh, this was part of our talk on collaboration. And that was something people love to talk about. This class had a lot of discussion because they had just experienced collaboration on a major international level of all the healthcare teams that came in to help during the disaster. So <clears throat> they were they were in a really receptive place for knowing how uh, relevant it was to collaborate and work together with other healthcare providers, institutions, and organizations. That was no question there. This is a sign that we actually took a picture of around Christmas time of, of uh, 2013, just a couple months, or not even two months after the disaster, when people start putting up signs to thank all the foreigners and, um, and the other uh, groups that came in to help during their disaster. So I thought I'd put that in. It was a really nice reminder of how important collaboration is how important it is, no matter what our setting is, uh, that we realize that none of us are an island, that we all need each other. We need um, we need help in any normal setting when we're doing things. If we're a small hospital or a birth center, we need tertiary care hospitals. And when you're in a situation where all the hospitals are smashed, you need uh, foreigners to fly in with their tent hospitals and set them up for you, and that's what happened in our disaster. And TAN was, of course, the baby friendly. And people were pretty familiar with this one because the Philippines has done a good job. UNICEF is very strong in the Philippines. They've done a good job of getting this out. Um, of course, we still have problems getting the babies nursing in the first hour. We still have some pushback on some of the, um, everybody agrees to it in theory. And then when you want people to really do it, you have to kind of, you know, uh, talk detail, like what does that look like? So what do we, how do we have to change our behavior if the baby is going to stay in the mother's arms and breastfeed in that first hour? And then that's where it gets sometimes sticky with people and you're, you know, you realize you're saying things that are different than what they're doing. But um, for the most part, this one was pretty appreciated. We took time to go over all 10 steps again, not assume that everybody was there, talk about how important it was for survival. <laughs> So 40 hours later, we were done, and we, um, we, we had gone through 
uh, all 10 steps, taking about four hours each time. Every one of our trainings, we had five trainings that were eight hours long, and we broke it into uh, two steps per training uh, with, with discussion time and practical skills time for some of it. And so we wrapped it up at that point. Now, this was a really fun trip was when we gave them their birth bags and we put together, this is the hotel room where we were putting together uh, the bags. Um, the bag said a gift from Mercy in Action on the top of it and they were full of things that the midwives hadn't had ever. So, so um, even before the storm, they hadn't had a lot of their emergency stuff. Uh, we replaced everything that got washed away for them, and then we added things they hadn't had. Most midwives hadn't had an Ambu bag. They hadn't had a Doppler. They hadn't been able to do their own some of their own simple lab work. Um, we gave them the non-inflatable anti-shock garment. We'd already given that the month before. And then we gave everybody something really precious to those survivors was solar lamps and phone chargers so that when the power <laughs> was out, uh, they would be able to suture or they would be able to you know, use their phones for emergency calls. Uh, we added teaching aids they didn't have before. So we gave them um, baby dolls and um, posters and things that they could use to be doing their trainings and helping their mothers understand concepts. And um, so we really did leave them better equipped than before the storm. And there's as we're zipping up the bags with all their little, and we were able even to order dolls that, you know, were Asian, <laughs> Asian baby dolls, so that it was culturally competent. There's a picture of some of the um, contents of the bags before we loaded them all up. We've got really bright blood pressure cuffs, um, yeah, brand new everything, and People were just beside themselves with happiness over all of this. And then, like I said, we made sure everyone had a copy of the IMBCI slides in book form. So we just slipped these in, you know, clear uh, binder holders. And um, then when they had, we were gone and no longer had the PowerPoint, uh, they could remember the messages. And this was our very last day. Everyone has their birth bag. Everyone got a printed certificate of completion, which means a lot to people in that culture uh, to have a certificate that you've attended a training. Um, our numbers had weeded down a little bit. We didn't finish with as many as we'd started with, uh, but we did pretty good. I mean, considering that, that, like I said, the first day we would have done this for uh, one person. We would have done it just for the midwife that we are rebuilding the clinic for, but we were able to, to help all these other people. Uh, there's also a couple of people here that also um, didn't get in the picture. So, As we were leaving the hotel, I took a picture of this sign. I thought it was very dear. Uh, this, they, all over the island, there was the places where people wrote signs to those that had helped them. Uh, this one said, in the midst of our trials, you gave us a helping hand, a sincere prayer, a ray of hope. All these lighted our load, warmed our hearts, gave us strength, and slowly put smiles back on our faces. So that was our group and their final t-shirts on the very last day. And um, I will field questions now. If anyone wants to put questions in the chat box to ask us any specifics or any logistics of, of how or why we did this training. And by the way, we did give everyone the option on the last day. We showed them all the, um, the information on the website about the MB nets, and we told them what it would take to achieve that status, and we offered to help them and Narissa Cumpio uh, did take us up on that offer. She made sure when she was designing and, and re-furnishing uh, the birth center that we helped her rebuild, that it would all meet requirements. And she um, did apply and has been accepted as a MB net site. So we're very excited about that. Uh, my future goal would be to go back down and gather these same women up again and uh, maybe just have a weekend.
seminar and um, talk about IMBCI again and see if anybody else feels like they're ready to begin the process of working toward those and how we could help them. Uh, or find out, you know, just kind of survey and say how many of the steps are you able to achieve um, at this point and where could we help you, how could we assist you. So that's a goal for, for next year uh, that we would do that maybe. Um, uh, you know, before another year has gone by since we finished the training. Okay, so I'm seeing Deborah's question. Know how we can bring your training to our other sites and inspire others. Oh, well, anything we have done, we will share. Uh, that's what this is all about. We just, we just didn't really have, we don't really have a written curriculum for what we did. We just used the 10 steps, I mean, that was our launching point, and we found that we could easily talk for four hours on every step, and um, I think that anyone who's actually uh, using the steps in, in real life practice could do the same. Um, they, they would just talk about what they do and how to do it and why it's important and field questions and concerns, and like we did, we let these midwives tell us stories about uh, times they were upset because the mother wouldn't lay down, or times they were um, upset because the hospital just has policies that takes away the baby, or, you know, we just kind of help people talk and then troubleshoot and then think how we could do things differently. Um, so there wasn't, there wasn't a real written curriculum. We didn't even go down with notes. We would literally show the slide and say this is step five, and then we would just start uh, talking um, about all the points in it, and and found that it was it was it was pretty easy to fill the time, um, and we could have done more. So I'm hoping maybe just this webinar will inspire inspire people uh, to put together something like that. I think for hospitals that are working on becoming sites, so they're not doing all ten steps yet, um, they might already be having a monthly meeting. And um, it's hard for a lot of people to take a whole eight-hour day once a month. Of course, um, these women were in the whole process of building back their lives, so maybe it was a little easier for them. Okay, what about for sites that might not already achieve or have knowledge about how to achieve all the steps? How can we help them? Well, that was pretty much our situation. Um, in the disaster zone, we brought the 10 steps with us, and the midwives that had worked in our tents um, right after the disaster were familiar with them, but none of these other midwives were. So there's only about two people in our training that had ever even heard of it. So we really were starting from scratch. Um, what we had in our advantage is that they were hungry to learn. Um, they were they were pretty receptive, and they wanted to 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 do this. Um, so, yeah, we were pretty much working with people that hadn't heard of it before. Okay, how do you feel about the older midwives accepting new ideas? Okay, um, I have to tell a little anecdotal story because a couple months after our training, uh, Narissa told us that she had left a cord uncut for a couple of hours <laughs> and her mother-in-law, who is the older midwife sitting next to me in this picture, had gone in the room and told the pregnant woman, or the, not the pregnant woman, the newly delivered woman, that she didn't agree with that and that she thought it was crazy. So we were kind of laughing about that, but that's some of the kind of things you run into from the older um, midwives. You have the two generations working together, and the younger one was saying, um, we're going to just leave the cord for a couple hours. And uh, especially in the Philippines, we're really, we're really pushing that one because of the um, high risk of neonatal tetanus. And if you wait just a few hours, the cords atrophy down enough that the, the tetanus bacteria is actually quite large, cannot move up it. And then, of course, we know everyone's talking about stem cells. So she was just waiting a couple hours, but the older midwife, her mother-in-law, went in and told the couple that that was crazy. Um, so I think things like this will happen, and we just have to kind of roll with it. And maybe her mother-in-law will never change her mind about that, but if she changed her mind about something else, it, it, that's important in one of the 10 steps, then, you know, it's still a victory. 
What was the hardest step to teach or achieve? Oh, well, you know, the very first one, I think, is the hardest one for people to get. Uh, it's the very first one, and the very first sentence is respect. Um, when, when you are working with healthcare providers that were not trained in that, uh, it can be really, in, it can feel intractable, but it's not. I mean, everybody can change. We all as human beings can change our behavior, but that's a tough one. And um, it's, I think it's the most important one. Uh, but a lot of times people want to do something. They'll grab one of the other steps, like, well, let's just, you know, we're going to change this, like not suctioning every baby or something, and they're happy to do something different. Uh, but but when you have to get to the heart of um, but you're still not you're still not treating the woman with respect or you're still talking to her rudely or you're still thinking it's okay to slap her legs um, you know with she's not got them wide enough apart for you uh, it's still okay to shame her and tell her it's her fault she hemorrhaged you know um, that that's hard that's a hard one I think it needs modeling it's hard to teach in a class because we can't model it there we can just talk about it. When we, um, when we bring midwives into our own birth center and we behavior model, then that's a lot more powerful. And by the way, we did invite these midwives to come up to Alangapo and spend time with us. And Nerissa did that. She came and actually spent a couple weeks with us going to birth with our midwives. So uh, we, we, again, hope to send that invitation out within the country more to let people come and see the modeled behavior. Okay, let me see here if I can go back up to these questions. How do you respectfully address respect when you know that who you are talking to may not know, right? <laughs> what they do and say is disrespectful. That's the whole problem right there is that everyone agrees to it in theory and they may not realize that the behavior that they're doing is so disrespectful. What we do, and we've done this in hospitals, when we went to Fabelia Hospital and talked, what we tried to do so hard is bring it down to how would you want to be treated? We always tried to bring it to that. I also tried to get any of the midwives that were there that had given birth to tell me their own birth story. And a lot of them would talk very, um, um, you know, upsettedly about the trauma they experienced when someone was rude to them. And, then, and that's probably the strongest, most powerful thing we can do is get them to relate and and see the connection between their behaviors toward women and what they didn't like. And the young women that haven't had babies yet, we just try to say, when when you're giving birth, like which model do you want would you want to be under? So uh but that is a that's a tricky one. And like I said, it's easier done in behavior modeling than just talking, but we did our very best. I don't know if I'm missing some other questions. Maybe Ian you can help me to roll this back up. I'm not sure if I'm missing something. Um, I'm kind of seeing your questions as you type them, but I don't know if I missed anybody. So if I did, you can retype your question or maybe Ian can scroll for me. Okay. Well, did we have... Um, oh, can you tell us a bit about the four hours and how you taught step one? Okay. Yeah, I think I covered that question. I think I did. What I loved about having the four hours was we could kind of decide where to focus. Uh, so we got a feel for the group, and I think anyone teaching this would get a feel for the group. Find out which of the steps are weaker, and then you can tailor it to spending more time. I think the respect issue, just we came around and around to it every time. It wasn't just once. It was, you know, we talk about it every time. Um, we probably kept talking about breastfeeding every time. You know, there's certain key points that are almost throughout, they're a theme throughout all of the 10 steps. How can you train and be exported to other countries? Oh my gosh, just take it. <laughs> you, can, you can take our ideas, please steal them and put them into practice anywhere. Um, anywhere that people could gather and have time uh, to spend four hours on each step and you have money in your budget to um, buy them lunch and rent a room. Um, anybody could could do this. I'm especially excited about the possibility of people getting a grant like we did from the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. But you see our big poster behind us. My husband had that made. It was a huge tarpaulin. And we put that up at every single training and took pictures around it and um, thanked our donors. But, uh, you know, like a country like Nepal right now would be 
the perfect place to get another grant like that and go in and gather all their midwives and say, out of the ashes of this disaster, let's, um, let's do capacity building in a real practical way and use these steps, these 10 steps as the foundation of that. Well, the trained midwives get periodic support on the 10 steps. So that's the plan that we, it's very loose at this point. Um, because technically our disaster, um, our disaster, our, and when I say our, I mean Mercy in Actions, our, uh, our disaster response and our recovery program were officially over uh, when we finished this training and when we finished getting the um, birth center rebuilt and refurnished and stocked. Uh, but it's not over in that we're still supporting that one midwife and that we have told all the midwives that came to our training that we're available to them for for advice or help with with doing the 10 steps, just basically being consultants to them. Um, but I would very much like to go back one more time and gather people and get a kind of a survey, you know, a year later and say, how are you doing with this? What's changed in your life? Which of the 10 steps are you having? Um, the most ease putting into practice and which ones are the hardest for you. So that's our plan. Anybody else have questions? Okay, well maybe uh, Ray or Deborah, I can turn it back over to you um, since it doesn't seem like anyone else has questions. Oh, and you are welcome. It was a joy for us to do it. Try for a minute. Try for a minute. This was an absolutely incredible presentation. It's allowed us to see the amazing work that you're doing and continue to do, as well as to inspire us all, because I agree with the questions. You know, we need to export this to all our sites and inspire so many others. So I can't thank you enough for taking the time to share it with us today. And I know that many people will be listening in later. So I hope that as they watch, they too get inspired and maybe what we can do is gather their questions and hopefully at another time invite you back to keep us moving um, and spreading the IMBCI around the world. So truly a heartfelt thank you from all of us, our board, and I'm sure everyone that's listening in now and who will listen in later. Thank you so much.